September 2nd. It was cloudy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of Homicide Division. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Warman. My name's Friday. A man had jumped from a downtown 10-story building. We checked what evidence we had, but we were still unable to get an identification. Before we could proceed with the investigation, we had to know who he was and why he jumped. Scott, you seen Frank around? He was supposed to meet me here. Just passed him in the hall of communications. Said he'd be right back, Frank. They keeping you busy? Oh, about the same. A little hectic around the house, though. Yeah, that's right. Frank mentioned something about that. You're getting ready for a wedding out at your house, aren't you? Yeah, my daughter Alice. She's getting a nice fellow. That's so? Yeah, ambitious boy, smart. He's a part-time accountant. Goes to law school at night down to Loyola. Real nice fellow. That's good. When are they getting married? A week from Saturday. My wife finally got her way. It's going to be a big church thing. I'm glad it doesn't happen often. Well, you should have had all boys, gosh. You're going to give your daughter away, I suppose. Yeah. Say, that reminds me. I've got to be sure and send my suit to the cleaners. Get a good press job on it. Sure is funny. What is? It seems the wife's been afraid for years we'd never get Alice married off. Now it's finding in the works. The wife's still unhappy. Oh, how's that? Oh, she goes moping around the house, dabbing her eyes with a handkerchief. Keeps muttering something about losing a little girl, a little girl's leaving her. I don't know. Well, how old's your daughter, Alice? Thirty-two. Well... Guess I better get started on this. Hi. Frank, what's doing? How'd you do on that jumper? Nothing. No make on the fence, huh? Well, a couple of laundry marks on his clothes. We're checking them out. Yeah. Anything else doing? No. Hey, they just posted the list inside, the annual physical exams. Am I on it? Sure, both of us. We're supposed to report to room 19 at the academy, Monday, 10 o'clock. Who's doing the examinations? Dr. Severn. Oh. What's the matter? Well, he's the one that checked me over last year. Told me to take off some weight. I haven't lost an ounce. I thought you were on a diet. I am, Joe. You even got one of those little calorie gizmos. You know, it tells you how many calories and everything. Yeah, I heard them. Doesn't do any good. I'm still gaining. Well, it seems to me if you keep count, you should lose some weight. You know me in addition, Joe. How about some lunch, huh? Hot shot. I got it. Well, here's one to roll out. I'll meet you out there. What is it? Stage Hotel, room 12. Yeah? Looks like murder. <laughs> a.m. We located the stage hotel on West Howard Street, half a dozen blocks from the city hall. It was in the heart of the Skid Row District, a white stucco building, three stories. We identified ourselves to the manager of the hotel, Mrs. Lorraine Washburn. She led the way up a flight of stairs to the second floor. The hallway was dingy. Down at the end on the left was room 12. We went in. The room was crowded with furniture, bric-a-brac, odds and ends. The walls were covered with pictures of old-time vaudeville stars, autographed programs, and theatrical posters. In the center of the room was an open steamer trunk full of costumes and bundles of news clippings. It looked like it had been ransacked. Tied to a chair was the body of a woman. She looked to be about 30 years of age, red hair. She'd been badly beaten about the face and head. body was an empty wine bottle, a pair of broken glasses, and a length of steel pipe about 10 inches long. There were blood stains on it. Frank put in a call to the office and then to the crime lab. The landlady identified the victim as Thelma Porter. We asked the landlady what time she discovered the body. About 11.20 this morning. Just where it is now, Sergeant. Nothing's been touched. I haven't mentioned it to anyone in the hotel. Poor thing. How long had the victim been staying here at the hotel, Miss Washburn? Former? Oh, at least two years. Maybe a little more than that. Isn't it a terrible thing? It just doesn't make sense. How do you mean, ma'am? Former didn't have any money. He was just like most of the people I have here. Stage folks. They're all older people. Most of them don't work too often. Live from hand to mouth most of the time. I see. Did Thelma Porter live in this room here alone? Yes, that's right. This is the thing, though. Thelma used to be married. Her husband died in the East about ten years ago, I think. Name was Carl. Thelma and Carl. They used to be an old vaudeville team, the two of them. Rose and Bernard. Did the Porter woman have many friends here at the hotel, ma'am? Oh, yes. She knew everybody. All my people are friendly with each other. Most of them are permanent. I guess we'll have to tell all of them about this. 
Yes, ma'am, I'm afraid so. Now, Miss Washburn, when was the last time you saw Mrs. Porter? I mean, before this morning, of course. Just after midnight last night. I was sitting down in the lobby of eating, just about to go to bed. Thelma came in with George Steele. He's a friend of Thelma's, lives here in the hotel. Mm-hmm. Thelma said good night and came upstairs here to her room. George and I sat a bit and talked, maybe 10, 15 minutes. Then this morning I was taking the fresh lemon around to the rooms. Knock on Thelma's door, but she didn't answer. Finally opened up with the pass key. There it was. Now, this George Steele that Mrs. Porter came in with, had she been out on a date with him, would you know? No, not exactly. You see, Thelma spent quite a bit of time at a bar down the street, Jack Hanley's place. She was there five, six nights every week. I see. George dropped in for a bottle of beer, had one with Thelma, I guess. Then the two of them came back to the hotel together. Did she have any visitors last night, do you know? No, sir, I don't. Does she have any enemies that you might know of, maybe somebody she didn't get along with? No, nobody I know of. And you can't think of a reason why anybody would want to kill her? I don't know. Maybe somebody thought she had money. She didn't. Not even enough to bury her. I don't know what's going to happen. Pancho? Hi, Don. Hi. Don, this is Mrs. Washburn, the manager. How do you do, Mr. Washburn? How do you do? This is it. Crime lab crew on the way over? Yeah, they'll be here in a minute. Will you be needing me anymore, Sergeant? Can I go now? We've got a few more questions we'd like to ask you, ma'am, if you don't mind. Well, it's quite a shock, you know. Terrible thing to have happen. Yes, ma'am. Such a terrible thing. All mixed up. I'm going to have to explain. What's that, ma'am? Tell me. She was three weeks behind in her rent. I carried her on the books. The owner of the hotel is going to want the rent money. It's going to have to come from someplace. Well, how did Mrs. Porter live? Didn't she have any income at all? She worked occasionally. Odd jobs. And she'd have the unemployment insurance. Even that ran out on her two or three weeks ago. I see. There's no reason in the world for it, Sergeant, killing someone. She wasn't too young or very pretty. She wasn't worth anything. She didn't even have a decent coat to go out in. Yes, ma'am. That trunk over there, full of papers. That's all she had. What sense does that make? I don't know, ma'am. We haven't started checking yet. Her clothes, a couple of scrapbooks. Nobody kill her for that. Pile of old news clippings. I don't know. It's been done for less. I continued to interview the landlady, Mrs. Washburn. She told me that the victim had quite a few male acquaintances that she'd met at neighborhood bars. She gave me the names of all those she knew of. 12.45 p.m. Sergeant J. Allen and the crew from the crime lab arrived. The body and the murder room were photographed from all angles. Dean Bergman processed everything in the room for latent fingerprints. The place was gone over thoroughly for further physical evidence. The only thing that didn't seem to belong in the room was the apparent murder weapon, a 10-inch length of steel pipe found beside the body. 1.05 p.m. After we put in a call to the coroner's office, we started checking with the residents of the hotel. No one gave us any direct leads to the killing, but more than a half a dozen of them told us that Mrs. Porter had been in the habit of making vague remarks about what she kept in that steamer trunk in her room. She made a point of never opening the trunk for anyone, and she hinted constantly, even in public, that she kept something of value inside. 4.45 p.m. We started checking out the list of the murdered woman's friends, which Mrs. Washburn and the tenants had given us. It went slow. We got little or nothing from the first dozen names on the list. 9.50 p.m. We went back to the office. Well, we've had better days, that's for sure. It's a lousy start. It couldn't be going much slower. We must have logged 40 miles of legwork. Nothing to show for it. Yeah. All right, God. All right, how'd you do? Not much. How about you and McCready? We checked out 10 names on the list, the Porter woman's friends. The only thing they could tell us we already knew. That business about the steamer trunk, Mrs. Porter hitting around, she had something valuable in it. Well, where's that leave us? We've got a fair motive to go on. The crime lab called just before you came in. They get anything? No latent prints. They went over that steamer trunk, though, found a hundred shares of some kind of mining stock sold in the liner of the trunk. Worth anything? Not the paper it's printed on. Never was worth anything, according to the broker who checked it. I got the blow-ups. Want to take a look at them? Yeah, thanks. A wine bottle. It's a wine drinker. Over there, it looks like he stepped on their glasses and broke them. Sure brutal, isn't it? Prowled the trunk, didn't he? It sets up the motor pretty well. The Porter woman spent plenty of time at bars. She had a lot of men friends. We know she did a lot of talking about the nest egg she was supposed to have locked up in that trunk. So one of her boyfriends believed her, went up to have a look through the trunk. 
Didn't know she was in the room. Had to kill her. It's a good possibility. Oh, we got the word from the coroner's office, by the way. Yeah, what'd they have to say? Cause of death was multiple skull fractures. They're sure they linked the pipe as a murder weapon. It was at Porter died about 4 a.m., they figure. Killer sure gave her a vicious beating. Looks like more legwork, huh? I wish it was an easier way. For every bar she drank at, everybody she talked to, we'll have to check them all. You know, there's just one thing that's got me stopped, Joe. Yeah, what's that? Thelma Porter. Don't you think she had an idea that mining stock was worthless? Well, I guess she did. Why'd she hang on to it? Why did she even keep the stock around? I don't know, Gotch. The only thing she had left were the scrapbooks, a couple of theater posters. Yeah. She knew they'd never pay off. and McCready, we went back to the West Howard Street neighborhood and started checking down the list of people known to the dead woman. One of them was a Miss Bab Sheldon, a singer in a small cabaret on the corner of West Howard and Pacheco. We went back to a small dressing room where we questioned the Sheldon girl. She said she'd known the victim for about five years. I kept telling Tommy to get out of that hotel. Living with those husbands wasn't any good for her. Do you know of any steady boyfriends she might have had recently, Miss Sheldon? No, not Thelma. She couldn't get interested in any man after Carl died. Her husband. That's what she told me anyway. There used to be a great vaudeville team, you know. She and her husband. Yes, ma'am, we know. Rose and Bernard. That's the way they were billed. You ever hear of them? Fine acrobatic routine. No, afraid not. Did Miss Porter ever mention anything to you about a steamer trunk that she kept in the room? Anything about what she kept in that trunk? No, not to me she didn't. It was a kind of a standing gag with people who knew Thelma. She was kind of funny about it. In what way? No, Thelma was a great talker, you know. Oh, this pencil's terrible. Thelma told everybody about her business. Talked to Blue Street. Uh-huh. She'd talk about her life, her personal affairs, especially when she had a few drinks. But I don't think I ever heard her mention to anybody what she had in that trunk. She'd hint around about it, call her a gold mine, but she'd never once let anyone see what was in that trunk. Not once. I'll leave you one of our cars, Miss Sheldon. If you happen to hear anything else that might help us, we'd appreciate it if you give us a call. Such a terrible mess. I don't know why it had to happen now. Lord knows what I'll look like at the funeral. Ma'am. I haven't got a decent black dress to my name. Mm-hmm.